Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have the amazing and wonderful Alyssa Grenfell on today. How are you, Alyssa? I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we are so excited. So we, of course, have, you know, knew who you were, knew about your book. We're really excited to get in touch. And then we happened to just run into you at Thrive in Provo last month, or was it two months ago where you were speaking? Oh, yeah, I think one or two months ago. It's yeah. all a blur, but but yeah, it was so great to meet you. And I'm. it's so fun to be here today. And I, it was great to, to meet in person because I had seen your TikTok content. Right. And so... I, you know, it's so cool. It's always funny to see someone on the internet and then to see them in person. Yes, and you have that moment of being like, like, oh, it like doesn't compute. So <laughs> it's, it was great to connect then and to be on now. Yeah, no, we are so excited. It seems like whenever I meet somebody in person that I've interacted with a lot online, they're always either way taller or way shorter than I thought, yeah. which is really funny. <laughs> You were just right. You were just how we pictured you. So. <laughs> just exactly. <laughs> just exactly perfect. Yes. And I will tell all of our listeners and viewers that um, Alyssa gave such a good talk at Thrive. It was really, really good. She was one of the keynote speakers there and, you know, just talked a lot of stuff from her book and everything, the kind of stuff we're going to talk about today. But it definitely had an impact on the audience. Like it, you could hear a pin drop. They were just laser focused and it was an excellent talk. And you said that you weren't really used to doing those. Like I assumed... Like you yeah. were on the circuit, you had it so down, but you said that wasn't really the case. Yeah, I mean, it was funny when I was prepared, you know, preparing for Thrive, just realizing that the last time I gave a speech to that many people in the same room, you know, was when I was giving a church talk, probably. So, you know, it, it's kind of the same thing, you know, producing content for the internet. Yep. Yep. You're just, I'm just here in my room. Yep looking at a camera, reading off yep. my notes, it feels very, you know, just, it almost feels like who's, it feels like not nervous. I don't get nervous, yeah, you know, in front exactly. of this type of camera, but right. in front of, you know, e even 50 people in a room feels much different than yeah. 50,000 people in viewing a video online. So yeah, it is it very does. different. It does. And we talked about that a little bit before when we were doing some prep that all of us kind of go, I don't think anyone's watching. I mean, I know they are, but you don't really feel like they are. And you're just having yeah. a conversation with a friend or a new friend. And I guess when you are asked to speak in the post-Mormon world, instead you say something like, when John DeLand first called me and asked me to speak, right? You have to use the same format, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I like to start by yeah. Webster's yeah. Dictionary defines yeah, exactly. ex-Mormon as <laughs> <laughs> faith crisis is defined in Webster's Dictionary as right. We've all given yeah. enough of those. Oh, that is really funny. That makes me almost want to do a whole talk like that. You know, kind of the juxtaposition between the two. That's crazy. Well, why don't we have Landon read um, Alyssa's bio really quick, and then we will just dive in and talk more about the book and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, okay. Alyssa Grenfeld was raised in a devout Mormon family. She attended Brigham Young University, served a full-time mission, and was married in the temple at 23. A year after exiting the church, she moved to New York City and began her own faith deconstruction. With her book, How to Leave the Mormon Church, she hopes to support and guide those who also choose to leave the all-consuming religion. And there's there a it is. Let's all book. hold yep. our books up at the same one. time. Yep. There, we've all got it. Yeah. Yay. I love this. <laughs> this book, the way, even the way it's laid out, it just makes you want to pick it up and read it. And and it's wonderful. And for those of you that are listening, instead of viewing, it's called, as Landon said, How to Leave the Mormon Church, an Ex-Mormon's Guide to Rebuilding After Religion. And Landon and I, we first started by kind of looking at the last, at the last page. And I'm actually going to read this because or the back cover is what I'm trying to say, because Landon and I, as we read down through this, we realized that we have done at least one, if not multiple podcasts on each of these points that she addresses in the book. And so that says to me that Alyssa absolutely has her finger on the pulse of what it's all about <laughs> when you leave the church. I mean, there are just things you kind of learn how to become an adult and try to learn how to come into your own. And it's really difficult. You know, some things are funny like we did an episode and I see you have a section here on coffee. How the heck do you order coffee, right? We made jokes yeah. about you go into a coffee shop and you're like, I want a fettuccine Alfredo. No, that's not right. <laughs> it's a cappuccino Al. You know, so I'm just going to read these really quick for those of you um, that are listening. Um, on the back cover, it says the last church handbook you'll ever need. This is just great. <laughs> it says here is the indispensable guide for navigating your way out of the Mormon church. 
After losing your faith, your first thought was likely, now what exactly? So read this book for advice on, and here she has wonderful bullet points, deciding whether or not to leave the church. So that's great. You know, what does this all mean? All of your your thoughts and your possible faith crisis, uh, sharing your news with family and friends, investigating new beliefs and frameworks, protecting your mental health during the transition, super important, moving forward with purpose and intention, ordering coffee and cocktails for the first time, <laughs> oh, overcoming shame surrounding sex and sexuality, dating outside the church, examining and renegotiating political opinions. That's a huge one too. And leaving Mormonism and ex-Mormonism <laughs> behind. That is the chapter right there. So we just thought even just the first glance at your back cover, we knew that there'd be such great information in here, you know, for anybody, no matter where they're at, if they just barely have just started or if they're toward the end where they're like, now I'm in an ex-Mormon confirmation bubble. What do I do now <laughs> as we all get stuck? So when did you know that you wanted to write a book? Like it's one thing to leave and go through all those steps. When did you say, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put this on paper. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, um, I always have wanted to write a book. I grew up loving reading and, you know, being an author always seemed like, you know, the most cool thing imaginable to me growing up. I, I have still all of these little journals where I would go and write the first chapter of a book and make it, make an attempt at, you know, 12 years old to start my first book. Um, so, you know, I, I always wanted to write a book and I think in reflecting after leaving, especially, you know, through the pandemic, having a lot of friends leave, a lot of acquaintances leave, and realizing how much of a need there was for just more resources uh, for those a after you've lost your faith. Because I think there's so many books about, you know, not just the CES letter, but there are so many books about the history of the church, Joseph mm -hmm. Smith, mm -hmm. you know, critiques online. There's, you know, there there's just so much, so many resources to help you deconstruct Mormonism um, and to kind of attack or like deconstruct the faith the faith claims of Mormonism. Um, but I just felt like when I was leaving and then when I was watching friends leave, there weren't enough resources about, you know, specifically after you've lost your faith, what do you do after that? So I think having left myself and then watching friend after friend after friend leave and then come and kind of ask, you know, I'd get a text, how did you tell your husband? Or I'd get a text, I'm about to try drinking for the first time. I have no idea what to buy. What is the difference between beer and wine? I, I have no idea. So I think just w going through it myself and then watching so many friends go through just so many of the same milestones, I realized, hey, it would be great if there was a guide, a resource that wasn't prescriptive, wasn't saying this is how you approach life full stop. I'm going to tell you what to do, but just almost a resource to give you ideas, help you think through frameworks, give suggestions to how to kind of begin to walk out of this world you've been living in. It, it really is kind of written like a handbook. I was a scout master and it kind of reminded <laughs> me of like uh, uh, maybe adult scouts uh, book or something, uh, you know, here's your, Here's your coffee drinking merit badge. Here's your alcohol <laughs> drinking merit badge. Here's your, uh, you know, sex merit badge. It kind of gives you a, an badges, adult yeah. thing of, yeah, here's how you learn about things. Just like you did in Boy Scouts, you you really had had a set up with, with different categories and you could read on each of those subjects. So I, I really like that. And it's, it's a fairly quick read, too. Yeah, I felt like... Um... You know, I think another thing I realized is how often as you leave, maybe you really, really want to go try drinking, but maybe you're not ready to uh, come out of the closet, you know, as gay, or maybe you're ready to... Um, you know, you want to wear tank tops, you want to try wearing tank tops, but you're not ready to kind of renegotiate, you know, dating and going there. So but basically, I think, you know, as as with all guidebooks, you might be ready for a certain section before you're ready to confront another section. So I felt like uh, making it a, a more, you know, a guide that you could open up the table of contents and say, I do, I'm ready to learn about this. <laughs> I'm ready to tell my parents, but I'm not ready to, you know, 
um, renegotiate my political opinions or uh, I'm not ready for cocktails, but I'm ready to share the news. Um, it kind of allows you to approach leaving in a kind of choose your own adventure kind of way where you can confront ideas when you're ready to and then say i'm not ready for that chapter you know i'm gonna switch past that one for now and maybe i'll be back to it in six months you know and, and i love that because there's no right or wrong and that really comes across in the book it's you it's all you what you want to do because sometimes i think there's pressure on the other side of mormonism to go what do you mean you haven't tried any alcohol yet right and that's me i don't want to drink i don't drink I'm not ready for that chapter, that merit badge. And that's not wrong. You know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with do you do you. And that really, really comes across in the book, um, which like you said, other things sometimes are really prescriptive about what you're supposed to feel and think and who you're supposed to be. And if you don't fit in that, you feel like, oh my gosh, now I've lost Mormonism and now I'm doing post-Mormonism wrong. I mean, you know, and that's just <laughs> not a great place to be. And so I also think it's really awesome that your friend group and your people that you associated with saw you as a really safe person and somebody with knowledge and compassion that they could ask these really sensitive questions to. So were you, I guess maybe tell our, our viewers and our listeners a little bit about as much as you're comfortable, you know, what started your faith crisis or why and, and your process there. And then were you pretty open with friends so that they knew you were a safe space? Cause they obviously did when they, in fact, that they came to you. Yeah. Um, and one thing I, I guess just before I answer your question that I thought of as you were talking um, is just that I feel like um, two things, I guess. First is that uh, information itself is often somewhat demonized in the church. So, you know, as a member, I might not even uh, seek out information because seeking out, you know, maybe anti-Mormon literature mm -hmm. Just just being exposed to information about something like sex feels like it's a sin. Um, you know, learning about the dangers of drugs, even like learning about alcohol, learning the differences between, you know, even like watching movies of women wearing shorts and tank tops could feel like it's a sin. So I think um, one of the points I make in the book is that reading a section about something like psychedelics doesn't is not the same as doing psychedelics, mm -hmm. but it, sometimes as a member as, or even as an ex member with guilt, it can feel like the same thing. So I think that's an important part of leaving the church is learning that exposing yourself to differing viewpoints is really healthy and that exposing yourself to viewpoints is not the same as partaking in the activity. It's not the same as doing something you're uncomfortable with. It's just education. Mm -hmm. And so you know, educating people about something like even like the temple, for example, can be seen as very taboo. But ultimately, if it's just information, I think demonizing information is something that Mormonism seems fairly good at. <laughs> so um, so I think that's an, an important aspect of the book, too, and that without information, we can't make in informed choices. Yeah. So you're never going to fully uh, understand yourself from like a sexual point of view or from a substance point of view, or even like if you've never tried swearing or you've never, you know, like you, you're never, if, if your entire life is motivated by fear of choices, like I'm afraid to seek information. I'm afraid to make a choice. I'm, I'm worried. I'm guilty. I'm, I'm avoiding out of the sake of worrying about sinning. Then it's very hard to live a full life because you're not going to be living an informed life. So I think that's the other portion of the book is that sometimes if we get information and we have a really harsh reaction to that information, that just the reaction can teach us so much about ourselves. And we can think, you know, am I not trying a new experience am i am i avoiding wearing shorts and buying underwear that i like because i feel guilty right. or because that's my truest purest choice like i i'm guessing for you not trying alcohol or not wanting to like that probably at this point feels like a very informed conscious choice you've made versus when you were a member where this the worry is probably more out of a, a worry of sinning and of being a bad person and getting yeah. your temple recommend taken away yeah no i'm sure another factor has come into play you say do i want to try it why do i why don't i what are my reasons you have to kind of 
dig deep and fathom where, where you really feel and where you're at. So I think that's, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. So, um, point, and then to answer point. your question about um, leaving, uh, I think for me, um, leaving was a lot based in coming to a personal uh, realization that I didn't believe in God anymore. And I think after losing a belief in God, I mean, then Mormonism obviously kind of got swept away mm. <laughs> with that. And I, I just had several experiences um, that were pretty life changing, I would say, or that felt felt really big uh, that just helped me kind of come to the conclusion and come to the realization for myself that God didn't exist. And an example of that, um, is that, you know, when I was waiting to go on my mission, I received a incredibly strong revelation that I felt like was a revelation that I was going to serve my mission in Italy. And when my mission call came, you know, this was a revelation. I cried. I wrote about it in my journal. And it was the same, you know, spiritual feeling that I had used to figure out that God exists or uh, that Joseph Smith was a prophet or the Book of Mormon was the word of God. Um, it was a feeling in my stomach, a feeling in my heart, a burning of the bosom that I had come to associate with God. And when I got my mission call, it was to Denver, Colorado. Oh. And oh, so very close. <laughs> uh, yeah, not quite the they same. They have Olive Garden there, so it's really pretty quite close. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Oh my goodness. So, you know, after an experience like that where you feel like, and, you know, I've been studying a lot about the life of Joseph Smith for some of my videos recently, and a lot of people who left, left because he just was basically a false prophet. He would say something like, you know, I learned one of the stories like he uh, told a, a, um, a family that he could resurrect their dead baby, the baby that had passed away. And he proclaimed to this baby, arise, arise. You know, he tried to to resurrect it and he couldn't. He just didn't. You know, he, it wasn't possible. Um, and a lot of people who were there during that specific conference left the church. And, you know, these were new converts who saw this happen and then chose to leave because he wasn't a prophet. He couldn't prophesy. He couldn't raise someone from the dead. He was just a man. And I think that I had enough experiences like that where I would feel like something happened that, you know, I had a, a belief in something. I felt I had had a very sure answer to a prayer and then had followed through on that only to realize that it was just a feeling in my heart. Like it was just a, a, a movement in my body, a feeling in my body that I had interpreted to be literally the word of God, a revelation from God. And uh, when it didn't come true, like my uh, experience with Italy versus Denver, you're kind of left scratching your head. Like how, how else can I interpret this other than either God doesn't exist. I mean, some people will say, well, it's probably because when you were going to be a senior missionary, you were going to go to Italy. Yeah. There's a and workaround. It's like, There's always so an you answer. you want me to here. wait for 50 <laughs> years to find out if that's... So that's wasting my whole... And then by the time I get my mission call as a senior missionary <laughs> to, you know, Wisconsin, <laughs> I'll just be like, well, maybe, you know, the Italy call was... That'll be my spirit mission in the afterlife. Oh, uh, you know, always, I'm just really impressed with you that... Seriously, what we're kind of laughing at this, but that is how people justify it and they remain yeah. in. It's the next life or it's not interpreted correctly. And also the fact that you didn't say there must be something wrong with me. You didn't do any of those. You looked externally and you're like, okay, I think there's wrong something wrong with this methodology that I'm using. So I'm very impressed because well. the rest of us, we beat ourselves up or we say it's the spirit world or we misunderstood. You were like, huh. This is not right. So I'm and I will say I, I did still f serve my whole year and a half long mission in Denver. I still went and I, I did initially. I definitely did that thing where I said, I must have been wrong. I must have just misinterpreted that revelation. I must have just, you know, I got that revelation in the temple when I was doing baptisms for the dead. And so to me, it was like, can God lie in a revelation in the temple? At wow. that point, I still believed in God. So I just felt like I must have, you know, the antennas got crossed. I, I right. was the one that was wrong. God's never wrong. And so, I mean, I stayed in the church for 
four or five years after that realization that this incredibly emotional feeling about like I'm gonna go to Italy you know that that was wrong it it took a lot of years (laughs) to still break that down I think Yeah. yeah one thing I realized is that probably that feeling meant that there was something connecting you to Italy, you know, in your own self. And so you connected that. And when you, when you're in the church, you want to turn that over to somebody else and you miss out on an experience that probably would have been very important to you. You could have just as easily said, I'm going to go study abroad in Italy and have the experience. And it would have turned into a wonderful thing because obviously it's something inside you that was that was calling to you. And and I was similar because I got called to Indiana and I'm <laughs> like, oh my gosh, as I've gone through life, I was going, boy, I learned nothing from that time in Indiana, but there were so many things I wanted to do. And I, so I always tell my kids now, I say, you know, don't let other people make the decisions for you. If you feel something, go and do it, pursue it. Don't wait for someone else to tell you about that. And that's one of the great blessings of leaving Mormonism is that you now get to make your own decisions. You're not waiting for someone else to get a revelation on your behalf. So. Yeah. Or like, or, you know, I mean, if I was truly empowered by the church or by the doctrine, I would have probably gotten that mission call and I would have said, no, I received a revelation. I'm supposed to be in Italy. So I, maybe I would have, you know, maybe I would have acted on that. Um, but ultimately Mormonism isn't a doctrine that's personally empowering. You're empowered to act in accordance with the doctrine, (laughs) um, which isn't true empowerment then. Right. Um, you know, if, if I were to go in and say like, oh, I got a revelation, you know, especially young men, if, if a young man goes to his parents and say, says, I got a revelation, I'm not supposed to serve a mission. They would say, God wouldn't say, reveal that to you. Um, you must, you're the one that's wrong. So ultimately it it isn't a a personally empowering religion. Wow. That's so interesting. And just the idea that you recognize, or you start to realize there is no God, most people who leave the church, it's it's other steps that eventually you deconstruct to the point where you don't believe in God. But but just to to realize that and then to take steps, like I I have a story similar to that where I I was always fairly agnostic even growing up. Though I grew up in the church, raised so orthodoxly. But when I was a mom of an eight year old, there was a moment where my eight year old was in primary children's hospital. He was very very ill. They were telling us this may not be great news, and I I very pragmatically thought, okay, here's my chance to test do I believe in God? I mean, because I didn't think I did. But if there's ever a moment where you're going to say, God, please help us, it would be then. And I'm sitting there in the lobby of the hospital and I realized there's nobody that I'm thinking of that I would pray to that will help me in this situation. I'm going to think about the doctors. I'm going to think about the nurses. I'm going to think about all the the science. I'm going to think about all that and send whatever vibes to the universe. But I really tested myself and realized I, there's nobody there that, that I'm thinking of that I will call on in this moment. But then I stayed in the church for another 20 years. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm saying, even though I realized that, I never thought, well, now I should take action and go on a different path. I didn't, you know, and that can be generational. So again, yeah. very admirable that you just said, all right, now I'm going to live a different life. And were you, I think I asked this before, were you pretty open then with friends right away? Because it sounds like they all had no problem coming to you when they were on a similar path. It's definitely been fairly interesting, I would say. Initially, um, so I left when I was about 23, and it was probably about six months of maybe back and forth of really fully deciding to act on it. I think for a while, and I talk about this in the book, I think it's pretty common for people to be like, maybe I can have like half a belief or maybe I can just continue to attend because I enjoy the community or maybe my belief will come back and everything will be the same as it used to be. And, you know, I kind of went through a phase of not wanting to admit to myself that I just didn't believe anymore. I don't think I was ready to deal with the implications of all of what that meant. Um, And so when I finally was ready to just say, okay, like, and you know, you can kind of see the path ahead of you if you don't believe anymore. Mm -hmm. Are you going to lie to your kids that you'll have someday? Are you going to baptize them? Are they going to get married in the temple? Am I going to keep giving 10% of my income to this church I don't believe in that 
ultimately now I'm starting to realize does a lot of damage in the world. Um, so I, I finally, I think I was just ready to see the writing on the wall and know I couldn't, I just couldn't keep doing, I couldn't fake it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, at that point I told, I had initially, basically, as soon as I started having these feelings and thoughts, I, I was talking to my husband about it. So I was pretty, I was pretty upfront with him totally upfront with him from the beginning. Um, But I kind of waited to tell anyone, basically anyone other than my husband, I waited until I was sure. Because I also feel like if you say you're having a faith crisis and then you decide you don't, you want to take it back, you can't really put the genie back in the bottle. (laughs) People are going to remember, especially like my family, I think. So I felt like I wanted to wait until I was pretty sure. Um, and then I told my parents and my siblings, um, and that was very difficult. Um, I think that there were a lot of tears, a lot of frustration. I mean, I had been married in the temple a year before. So I think to some extent, my parents felt like, you know, Hey, you just got, you just got married in the temple. You know, what happened? (laughs) Um, Uh, The fact I just went to the temple. (laughs) Where did it go wrong? (laughs) Yeah. My, my mom once said that she just wanted all of her daughters to be safely tucked away in temple marriages. And Mm -hmm. I just remember feeling like that sounds like I'm just going to cease to exist once I get married. Um, Like sudden, like I'm just, everything like the book is closed and now I'm just gonna like live this way for the like I'm not I can no longer be a flexible changeable human being after I'm married I'm just this book is shut you know (laughs) um the last chapter was written after marriage but um but yeah so I told my parents um they despite kind of the initial difficulties I think the ultimate net net was you know we still all love each other we'll figure out how to kind of move forward past this or through this or over it or under it and um after I had kind of finished telling everyone close to me I uh (laughs) well to back up my sister left before me and when my sister left there was so much gossip about her leaving Um, a lot of people saying, you know, she never had a testimony. A lot of people saying, you know, she, she had left after she was in a a new relation, a newish relationship. It's the person she's now married to, but people said she, you know, she got whisked away by this person and confused by this new relate. And it, it was just, you know, people would even come up to me and say, I'm so sorry your sister left. That will never happen to you, though. And, oh, we're so sad for her. Hopefully, you know, she'll find her way back. And just a, a just so much gossip about this, about my, my own sister. And so I think having seen that happen with her and knowing that that would certainly happen with me, too, with all of these people and, you know, not not so much caring ultimately what other people thought, but almost wanting to take a little bit more charge of my own narrative. Uh, I decided to just make a a very public face. It was Facebook at that point. Maybe now it would have been Instagram or whatever, TikTok. But uh, I I made a very public Facebook post um, basically saying, you know, before I start posting pictures of me in bikinis or drinking a latte or at drinks with friends, I'm just going to clear the air here (laughs) and I'm just going to decisively say I'm leaving the church. Here are the reasons why I put the, I, I copied and pasted the, the, um, the post, the original post into the book. Um, because I just, I, I really felt at that point specifically, like I wanted to, I wanted to be in charge of my own story and I wanted to be the one that people, that let people know. I didn't want it to be gossip. I didn't want it to, you know, be everybody telling each other I wanted to say just so that you all know I left the church um and then I would have people come and then I even put in the the Facebook post if you comment on this post I will delete it if you have something to say to me please direct message me about this um and I had people start trying to post you know smile or smiley faces frowny faces so sad or this is so tragic and every time I would just delete any comment and I'm like if you care about me direct message me like give me a one-on-one because you performatively 
putting this on this post and making the conversation about how you're coming on to my post and letting everyone else know how you're feeling no direct message me if you really care about me because that's what a real friend does so um that was another element of letting people know is like i just wanted them to know hey this ultimately is about me it's not about gossiping about me um and so i did have people direct message me too and that was really nice and have more of an actual dialogue about why i made the choice and then um i think so then i think through that very public post uh everyone i ever knew found out that i left the church and so a lot of people who initially you know i've had a lot of messages of people who who initially had very negative reactions and they'll leave you know i've had some friends say you know when you posted that i was really offended i decided i didn't want to speak to you again and then two or three years later they are messaging me saying i now think i no longer believe in the church and i need a friend uh can i can we have a phone call or something so um i think initially for a lot of people who i was close to at that point that post kind of left them feeling like hey maybe i should stop being friends with this person Mm -hmm. and some people i think really did (laughs) act on that feeling um but then i think because it was so public as the years have gone by you know i left when i was 23 that was that was before i would say almost all of the friends that i know who have left so i think that as the pandemic happened a lot of people i think left during the pandemic because they had a lot of time to think and read and research and reflect um as the years have gone on it's been very interesting to see kind of people who I stayed friends with or kind of stopped being friends with or, you know, acquaintances. I've had former MTC teachers I used to teach with. I have had former mission companions, just people who over the years have kind of reached out, you know, an old Relief Society president to say, you know, hey, I know you left from your Facebook post and from, you know, subsequent posts. Um, and I I would love to talk to you about it. Um, and now with Facebook or with YouTube and TikTok and all of this, I've had even more people get reached, you know, who know me somehow through some, you know, old ward or college or or whatever. So I think that that was the real jump starter to being like, I'm not leaving quietly. I'm not slipping away. I'm not falling away. I am walking out of the door and i would like everyone to know exactly why i made this choice wow head held high yeah because like for me the only thing i started doing is wearing an inch less uh, on my shoulders right that's my message hey look something's changed you know but you're right that leaves a lot of room for misinterpretation is she out is she in what's she doing you know then someone will run across something i've done some media and they're like oh my gosh so yeah applaud you on that i think that's amazing and and i think that's Even like when you land in what, like 2015 or so, is that when you started questioning the resources available now and just the connection through social media is so different now to be able to put people together because you land in, you were kind of just on your own when you, when you kind of stepped away mentally at first, similar to what Alyssa said, you wanted to be sure before you took any steps. Oh, I, I was exactly what you just said. I, uh, in my case, I had kids that I'd raised in the church and once you tell one. them, you can't untell them what, what you're going to tell them. So, yeah, I, you know, I took years to to make the decision, but it finally got to the point where my son was going to go on a mission and I was not going to go to the temple. Yeah. And oh, cool. that's where the narrative becomes important because, you know, he goes to the temple and I'm sitting outside the temple while all the neighbors are in the temple and I'm out there with my youngest son. And Mm -hmm. you're going, okay, none of these people know why I'm not in that temple, you know, uh, because uh, there there is no big announcement. You're obviously spinning. That's the only answer, right? right? That's it. It, Well, I didn't, I I told my kids when I told them, I said, I don't, I don't believe anymore, but I'm not going to tell you why. If you want to know, you can ask me. And none of them ever asked me. Um, So, you know, they're all out. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I couldn't just come out and say, here's all the reasons, because I didn't want to destroy my children's testimonies when they're going on a mission. I felt like that was their own journey to have and to figure out on their own. And if they had any concerns that they could come to me in the last 
five years, all of them have pretty much left at this point um, and, and found, you know, have had it on their own. But I was going to ask that because you, you mentioned that you seem to have a lot of friends who started coming to you. And I think the younger generation, uh, I'm seeing that a lot more where the younger kids, uh, the, the young adults, the 20 somethings are leaving quite heavily. Uh, you know, Rebecca and I's age group, uh, when, when we left, nobody asked us anything, nobody yeah. cared. My parents didn't ask any questions. My yeah. siblings didn't ask me any questions. Uh, but I, from my kids, I get the feeling that, uh, they have a lot of peers that are leaving along with them. Are you seeing that? Uh, in yeah, it's so interesting because it almost feels like I I've had a few conversations with people who are active about this and they always say, nobody's leaving like it's just so yeah. funny because everybody like whatever side you're on you think that that's what's happening <laughs> you know like yep. the the members who are still very active say almost everyone i know is still in it's a very small number of people and they never really seem to believe that much anyways and then on the ex-mormon or post-mormon side people are like oh we're leaving in droves everyone's <laughs> finding all this information on the internet and so because there's no published information really i mean there's statistics i think that have shown membership is declining in utah there's people personally reporting and you know but there's no different the church isn't putting out anything about this for, for sure so um i mean we see sometimes church buildings for sale mm -hmm. we see anecdotally our friends leaving so it's so hard to to tell what is really going on i think from my perspective many people are leaving. Um, I feel like I find out a new person every day somehow, you know, who's messaging me online saying, I left, you know, so and it no. seems, it does seem like a very large amount of people who are leaving. Um, especially now with social media, you know, people being a little bit more public about it. But, um, but then at the same time, when I talk to active members, they seem to see, feel like Zion is stronger than ever. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. That's a, that is a really interesting question though. Yeah. You're in the silo that you're in and that's what you see. Yeah. And I think we all recognize, even like you said, post-Mormons, we're in a confirmation bias bubble and we're looking for that evidence that there's shrinkage, right? And so we tend to yeah. find it so... So was there a point where you were in a mixed faith marriage then? Or if you're comfortable talking about that, I mean, your husband, you said you talked to him pretty right as soon as you knew that your feelings were pretty clear. Were you in mixed faith at all or? Yeah, um, not for not for long, certainly not as long as a lot of people end up going through. Um, basically, the way I see it is I kind of initiated the journey first, but he finished it first. Um. <laughs> so... I was the one that brought it up to him and said, hey, crazy thing I'm going to say, but I'm really starting to question not just the church, but even if God exists. And I feel like my brain is in a million different places. I, I want to talk about it. And he was also raised in a fairly nuanced, he had a much more nuanced upbringing than me. His mom is not a member. And so he and his parents are divorced. So he kind of split time between an active family and a non-member family. So I think he just always had a more nuanced view on things than I did. Um, initially, when I told him, he basically said, hey, I love you no matter what. I'm here for you. I still believe, but I'm here to talk. And, you know, I'm I'm going to love you no matter what. So, you know, that was kind of the initial piece. And then sometimes he would go to church and I wouldn't. And I would say maybe in the first month or two, it felt like I would leave and he would stay. Um, but then as we talked more and dug into church history, and he actually at the time was taking a history of the restoration class at BYU and they were jumping into a lot of stuff about polygamy stuff about you know <laughs> translation of the book of mormon and he it. had some very interesting conversations with a BYU professor basically saying hey i feel like all of this uh, information and evidence is really damning towards the church like how do you wrap your mind around this and is it accurate and the, the professor basically said that's all completely accurate and we all have questions <laughs> and, wow. you know, essentially just said, it's all true. 
you you get to decide with what you you do with the fact that all of that is true um you know so i think while i'm kind of deconstructing from a god point of view and a personal testimony in in the church kind of way he is much more in into the church history portion and as we are talking and as we're kind of comparing notes about this um he becomes he basically woke up one day and was like i think i don't believe anymore and i was like wait but i'm still holding on to my (laughs) i'm still holding on (laughs) don't let go yet like i don't want to be alone here either yeah um so he you know he basically he he fully stopped believing before me so those those months were really terrifying i mean that's that's nowhere near to what a lot of couples go through you know some i've had friends who they're three years apart like the wife leaves or the husband leaves and then three years later you know i've even heard a story recently i actually i don't know this person this is a friend of a friend but basically um the friend had a faith crisis uh she told her husband her husband divorced her she starts dating she's in a committed relationship and a year later the husband comes back and says i don't believe in the church anymore Mm. can like will you take me back basically and she's like no you divorced me for my like because i wasn't going to be a member anymore so i i mean the the relationship aspect especially if you have kids especially if you're on very different tracks i mean i had so much heartache about are not being on the same page for those few months and we were kind of mostly on the same page just maybe a week ahead a week behind a week you know a month off of each other and i can't i mean being in a full mixed faith marriage over the process of years i mean i've had friends get divorced i've had friends who have waited and then their their spouses end up leaving the church too and then they have this amazing reconnection basically so I, I mean, I definitely think that um, that aspect of leaving has to be one of the most harrowing parts of a journey for people who are married, and especially even more so if they have kids. Yeah, boy, again, Landon, she's describing your story, isn't she? Yeah, <laughs> you know? very much so. I, I was kind of wondering where you talked there because, you know, one, you were so young, uh, and two, you um, you know, where did you get, you, you hadn't experienced some of the life uh, things that other people would have experienced, you know, maybe raising teenage kids and then having to tell them and stuff. So yeah. how did you do your research and where did you uh, find answers on those things that weren't experiences that you personally have had? Um, I think for me, the the aspect of God was definitely the, the largest part. Mm-hmm. I think then I spent a lot of time, you know, I, I read the CES letter. I read some of Rough Stone Rolling. I, d- I don't think I made it all the way through in those months. It was a very long <laughs> you book. Um, yeah. You know, reading uh, the, the what are they called? The church gospel topics essays. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was huge because yeah. to some extent, uh, you're really trained as a, as a member to only trust sources put out by the church Mm -hmm. and to demonize other sources that are more negative so uh when i would go and read you know it was i think easier to find anti-mormon literature about polygamy let's say um and then as i'm reading about polygamy and thinking there's no way i've been mormon for 20 plus years i served a mission there's no way this is true and then hop on over to mormon.org or lds.org. I, I know they changed it recently, churchofchrist.org, um, the church's website, and the same names, the same dates, basically the same story, just portrayed in a faithful way. And kind of, you know, the Gospel Topics essays are kind of hidden on the church website. Yeah. They, this is not this is what they're putting in the, the, the manual for the Sunday school lesson, they basically want to admit it without having to admit it. <laughs> um, it was a lot of the same information. And I felt like I, I feel, I mean, even to this day, just 
how many photos, how many paint, uh, paintings specifically, how much art is there about Joseph and Emma being together, holding hands? Yeah. There's a statue in Temple Square. You know, I grew up loving Emma. She was an elect lady only to discover she was one of 30 plus women. And I've never seen a painting beautifully portraying Joseph with all 30 of them yeah. for a reason. Right. Yeah. So I just felt during that time I had a lot of anger about just the feeling of being lied to and the feeling like they knew this all along you know it's not like they just had no idea <laughs> it's not like many of these leaders don't know the history it's just that they choose not to tell it because it's pretty damning and it's not uh it's not portraying the church or joseph smith or early church history in the way that they would like us to believe is the way things happened it's not convincing when you tell the narrative to someone you're trying to convert <laughs> the the, the sure. actual narrative. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's true about the gospel topic essays. I mean, when they first came out in 2014 and teachers would use them, um, we know of some teachers that got in trouble because they were bringing anti-Mormon literature into the classroom. They're like, no, oh these are actually put out by the church, but, you know, hauled off to the bishop, hauled off to the stake president, who also did not know that these were actual essays. Wow. So, that's yeah, crazy. They, they are so damning. And, and, but again, a lot of people don't know where to find them or just kind of stay away. So, so when I look through just all the wonderful chapters and things in your book, I'm sure you get a lot of people emailing you and texting you and messaging you about things. Are there any chapters where re they really seem to have struck a chord? Like, can you say, yeah, I get more comments about this aspect of it, or is it kind of just across the board? Everyone has their own thing that they're, that is, you know, a concern to them, or is there something that you get more more requests to talk about or requests for information um, on i think that the the theme of excitement at kind of your newfound freedom is one that is shared a lot because i think often a lot of maybe i think it's a stereotype but a lot of people feel that ex-mormonism is very negative exactly. it's a very angry space to be in it's very broody you know we're all the angry exmos obviously you know that's the stereotype um and i think that the a common um i guess compliment or thing that people really like about the book and about uh, my other content is just that a lot of it is really positive you know leaving Mormonism, that's like a party. We should be celebrating. Um, this is, it's so exciting. You know, getting coffee for the first time was scary, but very fun. Trying drinks, you know, with friends. Um, wearing whatever clothing I want for the first time in my life. These are really beautiful moments and they can be very scary. Um, you know, buying your first vibrator or whatever, like exactly. these are all really taboo, scary topics. Uh, but they're also moments that you get to, you know, discover so much about yourself and even, you know, having this new life, this new, all these new opportunities with my husband, like we tried coffee for the first time together. You know, it, it's very bonding, I think. And it's very uh, exhilarating. It's fun. It's a beautiful like stepping outside of yourself kind of experience and um so i think that you know that's not really maybe one topic in particular but maybe more of a mindset shift mm -hmm. around leaving the church yep. which is not you know everything is going to be bad after this and the church isn't true which means there's nothing good left in the world right. um but instead viewing it as wow, like the the world is a playground and I get to do whatever I want. And I all I have to do is be true to myself and love myself and love my family. I don't have to seek authority from a church or religion or God anymore. I can just f choose a life. You know, I'm, I'm no longer thinking, is this a woman's role? Is this what a good, you know, is, is this a, what an elect lady would do or whatever? You know, I'm just asking myself, you know, do I want to do it? And I think, you know, in getting, I have like a nose piercing, I have some tattoos and mm -hmm. people on the internet will say, ah, oh, you look good job leaving the church, but now you look worse than ever before. And like, <laughs> I love just, you know, being like, you know, guess what? 
maybe my body belongs to you. All right, sorry, <laughs> cut that out. Just that's kidding. what you yeah, think that your body belongs to someone <laughs> you else. Yeah, think my body belongs right. to you, and you feel totally free saying, "I hate your tattoo," but guess what? I didn't get my tattoo for you. Exactly. Um, surprise, and a stranger on the internet. But I actually got my tattoo because I love it, and I don't. I didn't get a nose piercing because I was hoping other people would pay attention to me. I got a nose piercing because my nose belongs to me That's and it right. is on my own face That's right. <laughs> and I like it so I think that these shifts away from wondering what a religion thinks wondering what my gender role is wondering what God is, thinks of me wondering about being a sinner or being righteous enough shifting all of that and literally just throwing it in the trash and setting on a fire and saying I I in, in my own body, I get to choose what clothes to put on it. I get to choose what food to put on my mouth. I get to choose where to take it on Sunday and where to not take it. And that to me is, it's just the most exciting part of being out of the church is just the absolute freedom that I've, I've never experienced. Not just freedom to choose, but my mind is free to, to just think whatever thoughts I want to think and not think, you know, I feel like I used to, in my Mormon mind, just have this constant dome of God or dome of religion over my head yeah. that yeah. everything is like sieved through this membrane of, is this what a good Mormon would do? Or is this what a, you know, a child of God would do? Or is this what God wants me to do? And it's almost like you're not, you're truly not alone in your own mind. God sees all your thoughts. So um, being alone in my own mind, even, and not having this schizophrenic experience of God viewing my thoughts and feeling guilty about even just thought crimes, um, is very, it's very freeing. I, th I think in post-Mormonism, that's one of the biggest thing mistakes we make is we don't emphasize the freedom and the joy of escaping yeah. those ideas. I think a lot of times we want to tell our friends or other people, you know, oh, it's it, this is what it did. This is the damage it's doing, da, da, da. But we don't say, oh, look at all the, the, the advantages of having overcome that. Uh, and, and I like to say, I know they always say, oh, you left to sin. And I'm like, no, because I don't believe in sin anymore. So therefore, I can't. I didn't Everything leave you the think sin. Is a sin is not. A I'm sin. now just making choices. <laughs> yeah, some are the good, some are bad, think... some are right, some are wrong. But they're just choices, and they belong to me. They yeah. don't belong to anybody else. It's not someone told me to do it, or, yeah. or I'm cho I chose it. I take the responsibility. If it's bad, I take the responsibility. If it's good, I take control of my own choices. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the fact that, you know, Mormons think drinking coffee is a sin, that shows a lot more about them than it does about me. Mm -hmm. Like that, you know, that shows a lot more about the the hold that a religion can have on people. Yeah. Um, or the fact that, you know, showing this much of my shoulder yeah. Yeah. is exactly. a sin, like that my own body is a sin because yeah. this part of my body is sinful if it's exposed. That's that is an absolutely insane mindset and it's the mindset that millions of people have <laughs> i know when you you once you're on the other side of that you really feel sorry for them that that you know they're not making up that reaction when they see this they're not inventing that they have a reaction to it or if they see you you know with your starbucks or whatever they're they're very upset you know and i've experienced that with family members and you almost have to step back and just you know, I, I don't blame them because I understand that they're so controlled and they still have, I like that, that dome with everything, a sieve going through, that's exactly it. And you never have a thought, mm -hmm. it's just yours. It's always couched in, well, you know, what would the prophet want me to do? What would God want me to do? What does the church as a whole say? You never, it's very schizophrenic. I love how you put that. That's a perfect way to describe it. So, so I was speaking of coffee, would you describe, just because I think it's so cute to ask people this, did you and your husband like research? Okay, what are we going to order? We know we're going here. It sounds so silly to people. Those of our, in our audience that are never Mormons, this is such a common thing. Everyone knows how to drink coffee. We don't. We're like little children when we come out. We really have no idea. And so everyone has such a funny or interesting first coffee experience. So would you be comfortable sharing yours? I just think it's so fun to ask people that. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, we def I, I think we did some research. I, you know, the ex-Mormon subreddit is a great 
wealth of information. Sometimes people on there can be a little salty, but that's all of Reddit. So, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, but I think somebody had re recommended trying a mocha, which is, I, that's what I say in the book too. Uh, something with a little chocolate, some cream just to kind of soften the taste a little, but um, yeah, so we both went and we went to a place, a coffee shop in Salt Lake, uh, just like a local coffee shop. I, I can't even remember the name now, but um, we ordered and we sat down and we both, you know, we snapped pictures of each other because it was such a big moment. It's funny because uh, I, I was talking to somebody about this who's a, a not like has never been Mormon, never Mormon. Right. And they were like asking me about this momentous occasion of trying alcohol for the first time. And it's funny to realize I don't have a, a photo of me trying alcohol for the first time because the big thing for me was the coffee. Yep. You know, yep. that was the moment, you know, by the time I tried coffee, I, you know, alcohol felt like almost no big deal because yeah. i had already broken this massive word of wisdom taboo um but yeah so we both sipped it and um i'm trying to remember i feel like we took the pictures i i feel like we it was it's always almost a little uh anticlimactic because that's, you're like, what, <laughs> that's <laughs> it you know the, the, the there's i thought so much demons building. were gonna come and grab me and drag me away <laughs> <laughs> yeah just one you, cup right they you say just it build over up and over. to it so much and you're like okay we're gonna order what what are we gonna order let's sit down we'll take the picture and then you get to the sipping part and you're like it's just like flavor like it's almost like drinking i guess tea like yeah. it's flavored water you know it has water with flavor um and i i i mean i really like coffee now i think at the time you know your first few times trying it it's just a kind of a foreign substance but i do remember the very specific emotional reaction of realizing there's literally nothing special about this in mm. like a hell or heaven damnation fire and brimstone i'm a bad person kind of way you know it's just a drink it's you know you can drink it at work it's not even you know you can't drink alcohol at work because that's truly is a stimulus you know it's it's right. changes you <laughs> somewhat <laughs> but coffee is so mundane that like people yeah. just put it in car dealerships so kids can uh, drink it uh, so yeah. innocuous <laughs> yep. yes, and yet it will annoying. literally keep you from being with your family for eternity that's why i think coffee is this 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 flashpoint where once you realize that you're like oh my god you know the control i let someone have the control i gave to an organization this is nothing it's so innocuous yeah. and yet this idea that this could keep me from everything you know everything and that's when you start to realize at least for me i started to realize what what happened you know but, now yeah. i see it oh my god what what have i done what has happened so and of course it's different when you step away after five and a half decades and when you're so lucky enough to find your path forward when you're when you're younger which is amazing so and that's why i think you know i think this book anybody that has any question no matter how like like your chapter on sexuality you know that's a huge one but also you're like so ingrained in you that that's so embarrassing to even talk about or wonder about or what do i do now or what have i been missing you know here's a source where you can go to where you very matter of factly you know with some humor but just you really <laughs> get into it and you discuss it was that a hard chapter to write or were you like yes this is something that's so important i mean human sexuality that's something that we're all robbed of from day one be it knowledge or experience or any of that we as mormons yeah. we do not have a normal experience and you have to fight to recover from that no matter what age you leave the church yeah i i definitely like i it's one of the longest chapters because i think it's one of the most difficult aspects of leaving um and i think too like you said culturally just at large we struggle with how to learn about sex in a healthy non-taboo non-weird way i don't know if that's just the u.s but certainly it's not just isolated to being a member of the church it's kind of right. across the board um so it was definitely i would say difficult to write about in some respects um i think too you know there's the added layer of the fact that i'm you know i'm a 
cisgender heterosexual woman uh and a lot of people who leave the church you know being gay is a huge reason why people leave because it's so difficult to be active and be gay in the church um though obviously like some people like charlie bird they there's people who figure it out (laughs) They're doing some it. people figure it out but most people i think when they realize that they are gay or uh you know queer in some way uh end up leaving so i wanted to also have that be uh represented in the in this chapter about sex and sexuality because uh, i feel like some of those experiences aren't things that i can speak to personally so i did have um a friend who is a gay man right and then i have a friend who's a, a lesbian woman write their stories of what it was like to leave um my friend who wrote who's a lesbian woman she actually was married to a man um for a few years before she left they left together and then she basically said hey i i really should have never married you to begin with i'm a lesbian um and so i i i feel that it's i need to be with a woman so um so she shares her story crazy you know amazing story she's i love her um so anyways just just wanted to kind of represent multiple people's stories multiple viewpoints and then there's a lot of you know it's kind of a combination of learning about some terms to do with sex and sexuality like as when i left the church i had no idea what a a trans person even was i couldn't i i don't think i could have uh, articulated that back to someone what that even meant so there's terms like that because when you leave i don't think you're often educated on what what's the difference between someone who's non-binary what somebody who's trans somebody who's um bisexual there's just a lot of new words to learn when you've been raised in a pretty you know, high demand religion um so i i go into that uh, some in the book um also talking about pornography you know um masturbation is a big one so I try to cover all of the diff, not, you know, I, not all, literally all, but just a good broad overview of everything that is kind of packed inside that topic. Yeah, no, you do a really good job. And it seems like the, that chapter particularly is a really safe space to just kind of read through, like you said, get an overview, you know, say, okay, I'm totally normal that I'm wondering about this or questioning about this. And I'm totally normal in my circumstance that I don't know. Because I've had a lot of other people reading this book don't know either. And so, you know, it's okay that we learn about this. It's all right. You know, we can we can start from here. So, yeah, I really appreciated that whole part. You just, you took so much care, I think, with every chapter. So did you have a favorite part, Landon, as you read through the book that you Sorry. wished you would have had when you were actually leaving? <laughs> I mean, that's what I kept thinking. Where was this book? You know? well, <laughs> Luckily, everybody going forward <laughs> has it now, but... The thing that got me was how normal everything is to everybody else. It, like yeah. I looked at the pornography part and, you know, it, it, in the last, what, 10 years in the church, pornography was just the, you know, you're into pornography. Everyone's into pornography. And, you know, you cover it and say, this is normal. This is perfectly normal. You know, it's you don't have to be ashamed. This is a, a human, you know, normal human experience. To, to watch this and and so you you made you normalize things that previously had been so taboo you you start to see the normalcy of it and you explain it quite yeah simply. I feel like too talking about how there actually are a ton of problems with pornography and the pornography industry in mm-hmm. in general you know like those are the things we should be educated about about Mm -hmm. how to make sure creators are paid fairly how to make sure that you know basically there's safe safety on the set how to make sure that you're viewing people of legal age what you know whatever it is like there are a ton of issues in the in that industry um but those aren't the in those aren't the problems that we're educated about and even like how to use respectfully how to use when within a relationship how to view pornography how to talk to pornography use with your partner i mean if you you know how many women have divorced their husbands because they know they viewed pornography so even just bringing up the subject of of that is so incredibly painful and taboo so i think i also in that in that section try to say hey there actually are problems with the industry there are 
difficulties with use when you're in a relationship and how to navigate that and how to be respectful and how to communicate. But those aren't those aren't the things we are learning about at church and how to how to watch out for these pitfalls. We're just learning divorce your husband, you know, <laughs> no, anybody yeah. who ever does this is an addict. If you've yep. watched it once in the last yep. two months, you probably are an addict and you should be confessing to your bishop and, you know, stop taking the sacrament. So it's not, I think all of the conversations about this topic are very, they're so short-sighted. It's not saying it's, and that's the premise of the whole book is, hey, if you're going to engage in these things, do it with responsibility, understand the risks, understand if you have mental health problems or if you have an addictive personality or if you, you know, who are the people in your life and how might they be impacted by your use? Uh, these are the questions that help us make informed and good choices that don't negatively impact ourselves or the people around us, but they're not the questions we are taught to ask as members of the church. That's why I think a lot of, you know, ex-Mormons overdo it when they first leave. You know, I've had friends who open their marriages or like have do have risky sexual encounters because they're so you know, this is now like, I feel like if I could go back, I would have given friends, but different advice. But you know, when you're first leaving, it's you're, you're all just head in the clouds, but basically just that because we receive so little education about even, you know, drugs, for example, mm -hmm. you're, you're never knowing the difference necessarily between opioids and heroin and marijuana or weed and coffee it's all alcohol yeah, what's the difference the between you know if you're not educated about how these are actually fundamentally different substances uh and have very different risk profiles and different effects you could very easily walk into a very bad situation and i think that is kind of common too that people just since they have so little education, so few inhibitions, you know, the reason they don't do it is because of the church. It's not like I'm not taking these drugs because I know that they're very addictive. I'm not taking these drugs because I'm a Mormon and Mormons don't do drugs. So when you're no longer Mormon, uh, it's I think it's very easy to make some some risky choices that you wouldn't have made otherwise because you have so little education and so little constraints past just the fact that you're mormon so um i think that is another aspect of leaving especially i don't know maybe maybe it's just young people <laughs> who go and do all these crazy things no. but i think no. you know when you first leave i think a lot of people are like well i'm gonna do everything in the entire world because i no longer have any reason not to yeah. and ultimately that is really a bad idea <laughs> and it's really dangerous um i had a friend who was saying that their friends tried um psychedelics mushrooms and then they wanted to try pain pills and how she basically was like those are not the same thing <laughs> oh my god like those are actually like don't don't yeah. try opioids there's an op have you heard of the opioid epidemic <laughs> uh <laughs> start. Well, you know That's like scary um so it is it is kind of scary and i i, I feel like i probably could have made that even louder in the book just mm -hmm. to say hey just because you're free doesn't mean mm -hmm. everything comes with no consequences <laughs> yeah. so but you've never had to weigh those consequences you've just had to say i'm going to follow what the church says you've never had information you've never even entertained it because if you did have a thought about it Put it out of your mind, right? Certainly couldn't ask anybody about it. So you really are just a complete innocent abroad. You know, you have no yeah. concept of what's happening. Well, before you weren't doing it because you and you were uninformed while you weren't yes. doing it. You were yes. just doing it because you were told not to do it. Yes. And that's just as bad as doing it when you're doing it when you're uninformed. So yeah. There, yeah. there's really no difference. <laughs> you're still uninformed. Yeah. And, and so yeah. I think that's and the key part of your book is to inform. Exactly. Yes. And I think, too, like a lot of friends, like I have non-member friends who grew up seeing their parents drink a glass of wine at the end of work, you know, at the end of the day. And they've seen 
parents, you know, they've basically grown up seeing responsible use of mm -hmm. substances, um, specifically, and responsible potentially growing up and going through college and seeing, you know, people having different lives sexually and see like they've they've kind of slowly but surely built on this knowledge over a lifetime. Uh, maybe not every friend, but I think it's at least when it's less taboo, they've seen responsibility while still taking risks um and so they're more prepared to know and understand the world whereas when you're raised mormon you you've never seen your parents drink you've probably never seen maybe even your member grandparents drink mm -hmm. smoke cigarettes try these substances try wearing different types of clothing you know so it's it's kind of a, just a double whammy, really, because you have no information. You were raised in a bubble. Um, and then when you leave, you feel this sense of loss of everything you missed out on growing up, everything you missed out on maybe in college or, you know, whatever it is that you've given up for the sake of Mormonism. So you feel this incredibly large <laughs> sense of urgency to go and experience the world that you never were really allowing yourself to look at before. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. think you see that the older you are when you leave, I feel from what I've seen is more of that sense of just sadness for what could have been or choices that might have been different. And then this desire to play catch up. And I think even the older you are, the more detrimental it can be. You know, you might have young adult kids. There's just so many more family members that are impacted. So either end of the spectrum, I think. But no, you've hit it absolutely on the head. Don't you think, Landon? So clearly she's explained it. Yeah, I loved what she said there about you, you. You've seen responsible use as you're growing up. I think the other side of that is you've seen irresponsible use also, yeah. which yeah. then you know. I I know at work, you know, people would say, "Why don't you drink?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm Mormon." That's that was the answer. That's I the gave. only answer, right? But other guys didn't drink either, and you'd say, "Well, you know, why don't you drink?" Yeah. Well, because my father was an alcoholic and beat me and killed himself. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah. Those you know? are all reasons there. Yeah. So. But no, you make your own moral decision based on information. That's the whole point. Consent yeah. about everything. And that's what this book absolutely um, is a champion of, I find. So I know we just have a few minutes left before we have to wrap, wrap up here. I would love to have you just tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about what you mean by leaving ex-Mormonism behind. Because of course, we've spent the last you know hour talking <laughs> about Mormonism and leaving and the new experiences and things, but leaving ex-Mormonism behind is a huge part of it too. And not a lot of people talk about that. So I love that you covered that. Yeah, I think I think that I think of ex-Mormonism as kind of a revolving door mm -hmm. where you, when you first leave, you go through six months, a year, maybe, you know, however long it takes you of basically 24-7 binging content about the church and about church history, about, you know, you listen to Mormon stories, you listen to Mormonish, you go on TikTok, you search the hashtag ex-Mormon on Instagram. And it feels like it's very all consuming. And every time, you know, when you, when you, you know, I no longer snap a selfie when I drink coffee, <laughs> but there was a time in my life where I was taking pictures of myself drinking coffee, not to post online, but just because it was the wildest thing I'd ever done in my entire life. So you just go through a phase of feeling like, you know, first tank top ever, first time I've ordered a bikini, you know, and worn it to the beach, first time, all of these big moments. Um, I just called my mom and told her for the first time. And, you know, I just made it you know, for some people like Tinder profile for guys. And I'm a guy. This is the craziest thing. I You probably screenshotted the moment that you made it because it felt so crazy. <laughs> um, and these things feel so huge. And then, you know, after if, however long it takes, three years, five years, 10 years, you look back at those pictures and you, you know, it's like dusting off an old memory and it almost feels, you know, maybe if you're that man who made the Tinder profile for men, you're in a loving relationship and you've been together for five years and you're, it's just, it feels so normal, though at one point it felt so wild. So I think that hitting that hitting that point of ex 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 mormonism um is is really beautiful because it's the time of your life where you've really healed from this phase where 
it was all consuming and the new life that you've slowly rebuilt for yourself feels so normal feels so unremarkable almost because it's just your new life that is no longer you're snapping selfies taking coffee you're no longer you know texting at 2 a.m i can't believe you know how many wives did joseph smith have you know you're just kind of in this new life that it because it's your new life and you're so settled in it it just doesn't feel so raw or you know difficult anymore so um that's that's basically what it refers to and i think it's kind of funny because people online will say like oh ex-mormons make it their whole personality and obviously referring to the fact that i have an account about how i used to be mormon and now i'm not and it's so funny because i i have you know my friends will say that's I've never met someone that's like less obs- obsessive about the church than you, like in your personal life, because in my personal life, I, I listen to podcasts. I just enjoy because I enjoy them. I, I don't really listen to ex Mormon stuff in my personal time. I don't, you know, when under the banner of heaven came out for an example, I had a ton of friends who were freshly ex Mormon text me and say, did you see this? And it took me months to get around to watching it because I just, it just wasn't, it's just not my thing anymore in my personal time to be fixating on Mormonism. And when I put on a tank top, I just enjoy myself. You know, um, I don't feel like I'm almost like breaking generational, uh, generational Mormon chain every time I put on a tank top, even though that's how I used to feel. So um, I think hitting that point is really beautiful because it just means that you've kind of I feel like it's like basically like getting I uh, in the book compare it to getting over an old breakup where at first when you break up with someone you stalk them on Facebook or whatever or you uh, look through old text messages you're looking at old photos and you're kind of debriefing emotionally with yourself constantly about the relationship and then someday you're in a new relationship and maybe just even if enough time passes, you'll probably forget that person's name. You know, um, I so, like I, I that's how I feel about past, you know, people from high school or college. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. I can't even remember their name, <laughs> but no. it used to feel so huge. And right. I, I think that that's that breakup mentality is is how Mormonism can feel because it's so, when it's so fresh, it feels like you'll never get over it and you'll it'll never go away and it will always dominate so much of you and then after enough time passes after you keep working on yourself after you've made new connections and found new communities it can start to feel like you know you just kind of scratch your head and think oh yeah that was that's it yep that happened once you know but it's a it's a memory it's not it's no longer just part of who you are yeah, I love that. That was a crazy ride. You say to yourself, <laughs> what is it? You always say, Landon, you always say, I'm never going to give them another. You always have a phrase that you say. Do you remember? I'm not sure which one you're talking about. I have a <laughs> lot like of phrases. Just like as a post-Mormon, you're like, I'm not going to give that one more ounce yeah, or second of my life. I don't want to give them any you know? more of my time. I don't yeah. want to give them any more of my money. I don't want to give yeah. them any more of myself. Yeah, so. more of myself. That's exactly In fact, it. you know, I do this not, not because I'm, you know, obsessed with Mormonism, but because I want to help other people who came out and didn't have a place to go, which is where I found myself when, when I went through the crisis. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm hopeful that there's a place that people can go when they come out. Yeah. And I think there is more than ever before, more than when you, you know, were searching or, or when I was searching and, and this book, everybody hold it up again. Here it is. (laughs) This is a safe space to be wherever you are. That was my takeaway, wherever you are. If you're just about, you know, through and you're ready to leave, even ex-Mormonism, that's great. There's some great things in here. If you're just starting and you're in that, I got to watch everything. There's wonderful things in here. If you're in the phase where you're like, now what? So this book covers it all. It really, you know, we we really do need to think of it like merit badges, don't we? Let <laughs> I've got my, I had coffee merit badge and I've got me, I bought a vibrator merit yeah. badge, right? <laughs> I love it. And then you find yourself at the end and you're like, now I'm just kind of a normal person. And that's <laughs> So everybody please go out and get this book. Is it on, I'm assuming it's on audio too, or is it coming out? I am. So I'm about halfway through the recording. The audio is, it's just a slow process. I'm, I bet I'm one bite (laughs) at a time. Cause you know, I try to read like it's it's, so it's coming. I'm about halfway through. It's coming Um, everybody. It's currently, it's uh, available on, uh, um, 
what is it called? Not Audible, but Kindle. It's available oh, okay. on Kindle, okay, um, paperback and hardcover on Amazon. Okay, perfect. That's where you can find it. So everyone, number one, go get a copy of this. And then where else, and we'll put these links in the show notes, where else can we find any of your content that we anybody wants to view? So I am on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And YouTube is the biggest place to find me, I would say. Um, TikTok, I have the short form videos and they're on YouTube as well. But I have my longer form content on YouTube that I put out one video a week. Um, so that's that's more like if you're looking for a long form, kind of like a podcast mm -hmm. situation, um, then my YouTube videos are the best place for that. Oh, that's so excellent. Yeah. And we will include links to all of these everywhere that you can access this in the show notes, because I know you guys are going to want to check it all out. So any final thoughts, Landon? I think this has just been a really wonderful conversation. No, thank you. Uh, it, you know, we when we talked about your book, we said, how come no one ever thought about this before? That's what we said. Everybody <laughs> podcasts like... about this stuff. They talk about it, but nobody has ever sat down and just in, in this format, which is so accessible and, you know, so friendly and so warm and wonderful to read. We're like, this is amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, it was thank excellent. You. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking time. So uh, please comment, everybody. Um, have you read the book before? Are you dying to go out and get the book? What did you think about the different chapters that we discussed and your own personal journey and your own personal experience and where you are now? Well, leave us a comment. Leave Alyssa some comments. This is going to be great. Um, please like and subscribe to Mormonish Podcast. And if you'd like to be made aware of when new episodes drop, you can hit the notification bell. If you would like to help financially support Mormonish Podcast, we always have links in the show notes to PayPal, Venmo, mormonishpodcast.org. And we just give our heartfelt thanks to all of you that do support us. We really could not continue to make great content and bring you amazing guests like Alyssa without all of your help. So we really appreciate that. We also have a link to our merch store. I think, Landon, you have a mm -hmm. mug and a couple things there you can show yeah, off. We have some fun Mormonish merch. Yeah. Now that you read the book and you learn how to read <laughs> And, and you, you learn want how to, to get drink a coffee. You can. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And we had a request. I have to say, this is so funny, Landon. We said, you know, we have some t-shirts and sweatshirts and someone said, well, where are your tank tops? And I'm like, you're right. Why don't we have Mormonish tank tops? So those are in the works. That's right. So that you can show your port and shoulder and let everybody know this is where <laughs> I'm at right now. That's exactly it. So, all right. Excellent, everybody. Thank you so much again, Alyssa. Thank you, Landon. And we will catch you all next time on Mormonish Podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.